sure mm-hmm. people will continue piling in here in a little, for a little bit and then um, but we can start with like a quick recap because it's been a little while since our, our last episode as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, previously on Burning Bridges, uh, we talked about Layer Zero white paper, um, discussed a bunch of uh, you know potential vulnerabilities in the Layer Zero trust model. Uh, we heard all of our best takes about marketing bridge infrastructure and marketing things honestly. And uh, we had a wonderful discussion, uh, kind of impromptu discussion with Brian Pellegrino, the Layer Zero CEO. He was uh, very gracious with our criticisms and uh, we're kind of happy to have him. So hopefully we can have, uh, you know, a wonderful discussion about whatever we're going to talk about this week. Yeah. Um, I think between last time and this time, so last time, uh, our last session was pretty shortly after the wormhole hack, um, and we did get to cover a little bit of that. Um, I think fortunately between last time and this time, we haven't had anything extremely catastrophic happen in the bridging ecosystem. Um, though I think I'm sure that there have just been a ton of developments. Um, uh, I think Nomad actually had team developments as well. Uh, Nomad is, is now deployed to Evmos, I believe. Um, yeah, but, is that correct? In, in the process of, uh, of deploying. In the process, we, probably yeah. say. <laughs> we are also in the process. Um, um, yeah, and then uh, Arbitrum had a um, uh, had their had their like lower security, lower cost solution come out, which is also very interesting. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that too. Uh, yeah, that's right, and that come out. We just sort of announced the plan, um, but oh, okay. uh, yeah, it's sort of a um, uh, more of a side chain model as opposed to a roll up model, I guess. Is the is the executive summary, and we can yeah we can talk more about that later. That was awesome. Yeah. That plays right into our topic of discussion today. Indeed. I also, yeah. before we jump in, I also want to shout out Milkameda. Like, um, maybe that's some alpha that Nomad is also on Milkameda now, and uh, we'll be kind of working with more apps in the in the near future. Yeah, I mean, just for a little color there, uh, Milkameda is a, a fun. Uh, call it a roll up, maybe a, maybe a side chain toolkit for deploying. Uh, EVM compatible side chains against, you know, pretty much uh, any sort of uh, blockchain esque type uh, software. The first uh, ecosystem they chose was uh, the Cardano ecosystem, and they're looking at kind of Solana, uh, Algorand for to name a couple. Yeah. So that's your alpha yeah. for the day. Check out Macomeda. From my Web two days, there's always the like software as a service, platform as a service. P-A-A-S. I would call the Mimi way of uh, describing Milkameda as it's polygon as a service. So being able to spin up a, a side chain, uh, a secure side chain, support any chain that doesn't have an EVM already or is looking to scale with a side chain. Um, it's a really cool idea. And I think I will segue back into that part of our conversation, which is side chains versus L2s. How is this, how is this metaphor apt for bridging? Yeah. Um, Anybody else got kind of news, bridging news, before we move into our topic of discussion today? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think uh, there have been a lot of like little pieces of news across the board for a lot of different organizations. Um, I don't think that there has been anything that's been super, super major. Um, I think a big part of the reason for that is just that, you know, East Denver happened and then everybody got COVID. And so nothing has really happened in the last two weeks. Yeah, I think 50 of people on this panel got COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at least, yeah, <laughs> maybe 75. I don't know, <laughs> but I know at least 50 percent. Yeah. <laughs> um. Awesome. Well, um, yeah. I guess in that case, we can let's just jump right into the the meat of today's content, which is uh, multi-sig bridges uh, slash validator bridges slash POS bridges slash MPC bridges. Uh, what they are. Um, why they're important, why, what are their pitfalls, why are they a little scary sometimes, and, uh, and why is there so much pushback around them? Why is, why is there, why is it that, you know, what, what are some examples of them and why are, what kinds of problems do they have at security? Yeah, and uh, the, the, the fun episode title I came up with is uh, Baskin Bridges, 31 Flavors of Multisig. Nice. So, um, you know, I, I think there's there's many degrees of bridging, which is kind of why we're here to discuss that. Um, you know, uh, the, the first thing I have on my episode notes here is uh, what, what is a header relay? I mean, we can kind of talk about that. Seems like kind of the the most uh, the original bridge, as it were. And then we can kind of move up from there. All 
Arjun, that was uh, 100% a prompt for awesome. you to use your big brain. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, you know, I think in, in our first episode, um, and then generally, we've, we've put, out, put out this, like, thesis around uh, around what we like to call the interoperability trilemma, which is um, that there's a trade-off space around bridging um, where you, it's very, very difficult to, you know, difficult but not impossible, but very, very difficult to build bridges that are simultaneously um, uh, trust minimized, um, generalizable, which means that they can pass around arbitrary data, and uh, and also, um, you know, cheap and easy to deploy to different chains. Uh, so we call that, we, we kind of refer to that as like extensible. Uh, basically, that just means you can take the same kind of bridge infrastructure and deploy it to a bunch of other chains without either uh, each transaction costing millions of dollars in gas or uh, having to build a custom implementation each time. Um, and uh, this is definitely, you know, as with all mental models, this is definitely a bit reductionist. There's, there are certainly more trade-offs that can be taken here. But in general, what we found is that this, the, the, at least until like, you know, optimistic style bridging with Nomad came along, um, generally speaking, there were three, this led to three overarching flavors of, of bridge. Um, and, the, and the word bridge also comes, is, is sometimes like uh, a bit ambiguous because it can mean a lot of different kinds of things. But in this case, I just mean three different ways that users can get their value across chains. Um, uh, and the, the first was, uh, you know, um, atomic swaps. So, you know, very, very old school uh, HTLCs, um, also slightly more new school would be like connects NXTP that exists right now, um, where you have a set of people like LPs basically fronting capital on an, on a chain in order to receive capital on a sending chain. And like you, you could, you turning, you're turning this like very big, uh, hairy problem of, uh, of having these two chains talk to each other into a much easier problem of let's just have two people talk to each other. Um, and, uh, and that's, powerful because it's trust minimized. It's, it's powerful because it can be deployed anywhere very easily. Um, I mean, it works on Bitcoin, which means it can really work anywhere. Um, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, you, you can't really use it to do pass around like generalized data. So, um, you know, if you wanted to have a contract uh, tell its state to another contract, and what, what I mean by that is basically the contract saying, okay, uh, like for instance, the, the uni v3 contract saying, I have X amount of TVL in my contract associated with this uh, with this um, uh, this this token, um, and it tells that to the Uni v3 contract running on uh, on Optimism. Um, uh, that actually you wouldn't be able to do that using atomic swaps. It's just not possible because there's no there's no logical owner of that of that information, right? The, the owner of that is the contract itself. Um, the contract is trying to talk to another contract, and it's very unclear as to how a contract could validate anything off-chain. In fact, if it could, then we wouldn't have this problem to begin with. Um, so that brings us to the the two other flavors of bridging that that are probably the ones that we're going to kind of jump into now um, uh, as part of this discussion. The first is um, multi-sig bridges, um, which kind of take the uh, the third end of that trade-off, which is like a, you know uh, they compromise on security, but they are very generalizable, very easy to deploy. Um, and those come in a bunch of different flavors, uh, but they all effectively have the same set of like constraints. And then, uh, and then lastly, you know, natively verified bridges. So things like you know header relays that Connor just mentioned. Um, and yeah, maybe maybe we can start with just going into a little bit of the details of like what a header relay is, why it works, and uh, and why it's important. Uh, but also like what what is the big kind of what are the big issues with header relays in general? Yeah, before we jump into talking about header relays in particular, one thing I want to double click on is is the generalizable aspect. And I think this is where a ton of confusion comes in because I remember when like I've, I've had, I, I'm talking to a couple layer one teams and they always ask us questions like, is Nomad competitive with Connext, right? Because Connext and Nomad are both in, in the category of bridges. But I think this is where the language, the, the word bridge kind of betrays us because it can imply so many things. And so one question is, like, do we need to do a better job differentiating between channels, which allow for data and just arbitrary information, a general message passing, and token bridges, which in the context of Nomad, we see as more of an application layer construct where it allows for, you can either have like mint and burn token bridges or liquidity networks like Connects or even atomic swaps where people are able to swap ERC twenties or or fungible assets, I should say. Like before we jump into the um, categorization, exactly. yeah. the, the language I think is really important to elucidate. 
right yeah to, yeah to me another thing the language of bridge doesn't quite capture and maybe, maybe this is sort of what you were getting at too but there's bridges you know generally at least i think of bridges as the ability to actually sort of send cross chain messages from one chain to another um whereas things like atomic swaps you actually manage to achieve this outcome um say you know depositing or withdrawing a token without sort of one chain having to interpret the other at all um the sort of validation happens on this higher level and you have this like htlc atomic swap logic that you know ensures that um you'll sort of get the funds you need where you want them um, so yeah, weirdly atomic swaps themselves, that, that, that mechanism, at least the way I use the term doesn't require a bridge directly. Um, um, and yeah, it just, it sort of, um, becomes, becomes harder to talk about. I think most projects that are calling themselves bridges are, are, I would say sending some sort of cross chain messages one way or another. Um, but yeah, atomic swaps are kind of another, another beast, I would say. I don't know if you agree with that, Arjun. I think I would, um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have agreed with it like a year ago, but I think like at this stage, what we're finding is that at least from a practical perspective, like there's there's actually two facets to this problem of like cross chain communication. Um, there's the the message passing, which is which is a really important piece because doing that without trust is is like the key to creating these like fully generalizable applications that go across chain. I think I, I guess a good way to think about it is like um, you know you can think of like rollups versus state channels. So state channels are a scalability solution on Ethereum. I mean I guess rollups and, and state channels are both scalability solutions on Ethereum. Um, state channels make it possible to to like aggregate a bunch of one-to-one -one interactions, a bunch of payments into uh, into like one netted payment on chain. Um, and it's powerful because, you know, you don't have to like, you know, if you're if you're sending somebody $10, uh, like a cent every minute for like a thousand minutes, um, it's it's much uh, cheaper to just send one aggregated payment at the end uh, of $10 than it is to send all thousand of those payments on chain. Um, and uh, and so the, the kind of core goal of, of that structure is like, let's scale up this one very specific type of application. Let's make it very, very, make it possible to like do this one specific thing better. Whereas with rollups, the, the kind of key breakthrough of rollups was that this was the first mechanism where it wasn't, it wasn't specific to any kind of scalability. It was generalized to any arbitrary type of EVM compatible action that you wanted to do. Um, and that EVM compatible action was just being aggregated onto the chain. And so um, I, I would almost say it's like similar to that where, you know, I, like, you you can have you know there's there's two big pieces to this to this problem the first is like how do you get the message across chains in the first place and uh, and like what but like that's that's kind of um that's that's agnostic to like what that message might be and in some cases you actually don't want to be agnostic so like if you're if you're trying to call a contract on a receiving chain and you need to pass that contract data and then also funds you can't just make that work with data. You do also need to find some liquidity on the receiving chain to make that call. Um, and that's that's kind of the way that I, I think about it now is that like, you, know, you have bridges uh, like like Nomad or, or even I guess multi-state bridges or, or header relay bridges that allow you to pass around this data. And then they may or may not be paired with um, a what is effectively a liquidity network, some sort of mechanism to get the right asset on the on the chain that you want to go to. Um, and make sure that you have enough liquidity of that asset to be able to do things with it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think, you know, for something, again, just restricting the connect, like a connect state channel um, sort of lets you move liquidity in this nice way that can be convenient. And that's like one of the nice use cases of it is moving liquidity across change. But it's still sort of underneath that, there's this assumption that there is some bridge uh, that is providing that liquidity or that's creating that liquidity to begin with. In other words, exactly. If you're moving a particular asset across two chains, that sort of begets the question of where did that asset come from? And the state channel doesn't solve that problem. That that problem is solved by a bridge. A state channel right. sort of solves the problem of moving it. So, exactly. um, yeah. I mean, the, the like underlying assumption actually in all of these things, there's there's two underlying assumptions. It's, it's, I guess it's a bilateral assumption. So like, if you're a liquidity network, the underlying assumption is that someone somewhere has created a representation of the asset that you want to swap into. If that asset doesn't exist, like this is a fundamental like you know, piece of how Connect works, for instance, where like we, we can't really support chains that don't have, you know, a USDC representation because it doesn't like, how are you going to swap USDC on Polygon to USDC on another chain if that asset just doesn't even exist yet? Um, but fundamental, but like at the same time, um, you actually have this, a similar kind of assumption that exists with uh, with the bridges themselves, which is like, if a if a given bridge is trying to communicate with the chain or do, do, doing some operation on a chain where you know, you know that that bridge may be able to mint liquidity of an asset, but if that minted liquidity is not the canonical asset, so for instance, say like you know you're using 
Nomad to communicate between uh, Avalanche and Polygon. Um, and Nomad creates its own Nomad flavored asset on Polygon. Um, all of a sudden, as a user, you're now kind of like stuck with this thing that isn't actually going to be able to be used for a transaction. So if you try to make it so that you call a contract on Polygon using, you know, liquidity coming, USDC liquidity coming from Avalanche, um, you wouldn't be able to do that just using a bridge. You would actually need to have destination liquidity to swap into to make sure that like users can can have the right asset at the end of this. And it, I think it's important to understand that this is not a is not a technical kind of um, restriction. It's it's due to social consensus because of how yeah. liquidity creates network effects. So, for example, I think some context that is helpful here is to understand how bridges, uh, mint and burn bridges, work under the hood, which is they escrow assets on this on the sending chain and then mint a synthetic representation on the destination. So it's instead of like, again, the word bridge fails us because really what it acts as is uh, as a synthetic asset exchange. But applications on the destination chain, say Aave or a sushi swap or compound or whatever, will list addresses belonging to certain synthetics. And what Arjun's point is, is that if you bridge over using bridge number five, it'll mint to use synthetic number five. But the application likely only uses USDC synthetic number one or two. And so now you have something that you think is USDC, but doesn't actually map to the kind of things that you want to do on the destination chain. And so you you have to figure out who, like, what is the asset, the synthetic asset that the community on the destination chain has coalesced around and that has the deepest liquidity. Uh, and this is um, probably one of the forcing functions for the bridge wars, because everybody's trying to be the bridge that creates that uh, canonical asset. Canonical, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of are shorthand for this this problem or this annoyance is like asset fragmentation. Um, and it's both, yeah, on the one hand, it's the social coordination problem of, as you say, which synthetic representation of this token, who's like, you know, root is some other chain, which synthetic representation do we effectively treat as the canonical one? And that's just, yeah, that is this kind of annoying social coordination problem. Where it gets trickier, though, is if you have multiple token representations from different bridges, they might have different security assumptions underneath them. Um, and that is just not, necessarily obvious to communicate. In other words, you might have a representation of a coin minted from a trustless bridge and another one minted from a trusted bridge. And um, yeah, the holders of one are sort of exposed to risk that the others aren't. Um, so this is just something that like we need to think about generally. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah, a, smooth, this... a smooth brain question here. Sorry to interrupt. Um, no worries. Why, why don't we just use a stable swap or kind of create a wrapper and all the bridges can mint to the same wrapper? What's wrong with that? So you can use a stable swap. I actually think that's a viable model. The problem is basically just like adding slippage, adding liquidity overhead um, for every single asset that you do. So like you, you could create some sort of like, you know, basically bridge uh, merging contract where users can go and dump all of their, you know, uh, USDC on Polygon, like POS USDC, which is the kind of canonical one into this contract. And uh, and LPs can also like dump um, you know, uh, whichever other bridge asset. So any USDC, Nomad USDC, um, Seller USDC, whatever. Um, and uh, and then you can make it so that anytime anyone swaps into uh, this ecosystem or bridges into this ecosystem, now they're just swapping liquidity uh, available on the chain for liquidity available on the chain. The problem is, uh, one, uh, you know, you're incurring additional costs and slippage here, which is something ideally to be avoided, but of course may not always be avoidable. Um, but two, uh, it also gets kind of weird if like one of these one of these tokens depegs. So like now this liquidity, the liquidity of the system can be manipulated. Um, you know, you can potentially end up in a situation where you've been able to like steal some funds. This actually gets even worse if you wrap the tokens. So um, you know, some a proposal that's floated around for both in the Ethereum ecosystem and the Cosmos ecosystem is like, why don't you just have one asset that is has a connection to many bridges? Um, you know, so uh, any any USD any any swap. Nomad, Seller, um, the POS Bridge, and they all just mint the same asset. Um, and while that actually seems like an elegant solution, it does not actually it does actually fit the uh, fix the asset fragmentation problem. The problem is now the security of this whole system is the security of the weakest bridge. So yeah. if you make it permissionless, you can actually allow somebody to come and create a totally custodial bridge and then rug all of the funds for everyone, which is yeah. also quite bad. So yeah. I, I have kind of another smooth bearing question here. Um, 
uh, this this kind of discussion that we've been having uh, assumes that you know we uh, assumes understanding of uh, the need for a bridge in the first place. But the question I have is, uh, why are there so many bridges? And and what what is you know uh, we've seen proliferation of you know a bunch of side chains here. Uh, what are uh, well, why are there differences between these bridges? Uh, yeah, you know, kind of what you're getting at just there. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I think a big, a big part of that is, of course, just like market dynamics, right? We, I think it's like bull market, lots of VC money, lots of people interested in this problem, very, very big, very unsolved problem. And, it, and you know, let's be clear, like bridging and cross-chain communication is a trillion dollar problem. It is like, if, if you ended up in a scenario where one project was to win all of this, it would probably become, if not the biggest, pro if, if not one of the biggest projects in the space, the biggest project in the space, because it's just, like the, the most, the only thing more valuable than any chain is the thing that connects all of the different chains to each other. Um, and so there, there's definitely a lot of people just interested in the problem, uh, interested in finding ways to solve parts of the problem. But I think the other thing that also makes it uh, a little bit more competitive than it would have been otherwise is that there's also just a very, very big amount of information asymmetry where like, you know, uh, with, with the layer two ecosystem, for instance, there was a lot of research early on that happened. So like initially everybody was just like, okay, well, why don't we just scale up with sidechains? And like, this was, this was definitely like a proposal that existed in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin land before Ethereum where people did try to just scale things with sidechains with people, but like we found that there was no really trustless way to do that. And a lot of people were just like, yeah, that's fine. Um, um, but then we had like years of time. I mean, I, I guess, uh, uh, Daniel, you could probably like uh, speak to this as well, but like we've, we've had, we had years of time where we had the chance to like build mental models around okay, what are trustless ways to scale? And how can we introduce, how can we like make sure to work towards those trustless ways to scale, even if side chains are the like low hanging fruit? And how can we most importantly educate the community about that, right? So we, we had like years where people, we taught people about, uh, we taught people about why they, they should exist and their benefits. And that seems to have carried the ecosystem quite a bit until now where people are like, yeah, well, it's true that these other systems exist, but of course like rollups are like, the better option long term in terms if we're going for like pure trust minimization. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think as, as far as there's still being and, you know, the fact that there are and always will be multiple bridges is just the sort of like, for lack of a better term, good reasons and bad reasons for that. Not bad reasons, but the sort of <laughs> arbitrary reasons are, yeah, there's just market dynamics. There's a lot of projects still keep emerging and competing for the same market, but there's reasonable reasons that you want options. Um, as you say, like trust minimization is something that's important, but it's also not literally the only consideration right there's there's a lot of different dimensions bridges might want to optimize for which you which you kind of already mentioned but you know trust minimization low fees um interoperability with different chains including non-evm chains let's say um you know generalizability to smart contracts things like that so there is you know there's reasonable trade-offs to be to be had there which is why we we should see lots of bridges um and this actually brings up an interesting question where it's like, is there, is there a reason and room to have, so, so, you know, there's this whole thesis of like, okay, well, do you need to, when you, when you have better economic security, like for instance, on a rollup, you're paying for that economic security because it's coming from somewhere, it's coming from like an underlying chain, whereas on a side chain or even on a centralized system, like you, you don't really have as much economic security. Um, you don't have as much decentralization, but you might not care as much about it. And so, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily, the reason that you don't have it is because you don't want to pay for it. Um, in the first place. Um, one question that I have is just, you know, and this this is definitely like interesting in the context of like, you know, Arbitrum one, is, which is the roll up and then and then uh, the new the new stuff that you guys have put out recently with side chains. Um, how do you think about that trade off space? Like, it, is there is there room to have I mean, obviously, there is room to have cheaper, less secure things. Um, but how much room exists? And like, how do users differentiate? Yeah, I mean, I can I can start there. I'm curious to hear what everyone thinks on this question. But like, I definitely think um, as you say, you know, trust minimization or, you know, um, having sort of trustless interactions has a real serious cost, kind of no matter what, right? And rollups are about making this cheaper, but it's still going to be more costly than, for example, literally centralized systems. Um, and for that reason, there's no, you know, it shouldn't be the case that any application that wants to use, say, like the EVM or the EVM tech stack uh, needs to use the most trust minimized option. That just wouldn't make sense. Um, and yeah, I mean, part of the impetus for... Um, this like any what we call like any trust side chains um, proposal, which we've been planning on doing for a while. We've been talking about it for a while, but now we're sort of moving forward with it. Um, a big part of the reason is a lot of apps that are doing things like gaming, um, where they just sort of want to be able to have high throughput on chain. 
um, throughput that doesn't necessarily need to have high security, um, but they still, again, want to be able to sort of use this tech stack. Um, yeah, there's just increasingly it seems to be demand for that. So, you know, why not? Um, so, yeah, I think just having having a spectrum of options of options is good um, so long as it's clear to users and developers which ones they're using and why. Um, and obviously, I think the most important side of this and the most interesting side of this is the, the sort of truly trustless or trust minimized side of it. Um, but yeah, I'm all for there being a spectrum of options. Yeah, at risk of kind of rat holing into shared security and not getting into kind of multi-sig bridges and why kind of the dynamic is a little bit different for token bridges. Uh, I did notice that Sriram um, is here from, is listening in and Sriram works on Layer Labs, which is a really cool project that kind of allows um, other apps to be able to tap into existing security on Ethereum, right? So I think there is this great value in leveraging the existing security that has kind of uh, captured first over advantage and basically has proven itself over many years, over six, seven years. And, and people know that they can trust it and know that it'll keep running. But given how much demand there is for block space and for people engaging in building Web3 applications, inevitably less secure, kind of faster, uh, quickly spun up solutions will emerge. But do y'all think those things will stick around for the long run or will shared security kind of over time, as we make shared security more efficient, everything will coalesce around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it seems like it seems like a big part. The, the reason that this exists is because there is a cost to security, right? Like if you, uh, it's it's like if you if you obviated this problem in the first place and you made security incredibly cheap on every system, then uh, at least economic security cheap on every system, then then you wouldn't have this problem anymore. And that arguably that is that is what ETH two is is trying to do, which is like let's figure out a way to make it so that the the economic security of running uh, scalability solutions on Ethereum um, is so cheap that you know you never actually have this question of like oh do I need to move to a lower security environment to drop costs because you know the difference are is like fractions of a cent. Um, but until we get to that point, I mean, it is it, from a practical perspective, it is true that like people probably don't necessarily want to pay for that kind of security. I guess the the challenge becomes how do people even tell the difference, right? Like as a user, as an end user you're just using a chain. Um, you don't really care about what the practical to economic considerations of economic security are on that chain. So for instance, you know, you might, you might be using Polygon and like Polygon may have a certain amount of like economic security that is generated from their stake. Um, but it, it's not like anybody was really concerned about that when Polygon was growing because, you know, every single DeFi application deployed there, even though Polygon's like a part of like the thesis was like, okay, well, this is a cheaper chain meant for cheaper applications. Um, and so one, one thing that I am kind of concerned about is like in the past, I always sort of like, uh, whenever we were talking, whenever we would talk about this problem when doing like layer two research, I would always say, okay, well, actually this is a, this is a really good argument for layer two, because if you have everything running on like very cheap layer two systems, then you don't ever have to deal with this question of like, okay, how secure is this system actually? And how does the, the security of the system, uh, affect the way that I think about building my application, uh, because th there really isn't, there are no answers to those questions. Um, but since we don't have that case, it's almost like you you need some sort of like <laughs> ratings agency to to tell arbitrarily, just kind of tell developers like, okay, no, this is this is arbitrarily how much security you would have on this chain. This is what you should be able to build. This is not this is what you shouldn't build. Um, and and there really isn't a way to do that right now. Yeah. I'm I'm personally skeptical that there will be a time when, you know, the you can build something that an app that inherits from, you know, the highest security chain or among the highest security chains, um, that is also negligibly cheap. Like I think we can we can keep doing better and we are doing better of sort of expanding the the lanes of the trustless highway that, or, or something. Um I think like mm -hmm. L2s are doing that and those will get better. I think E2 will will do that and it will get better. But like ultimately you are going to hit this bottleneck and there will always be more you know, essentially more centralized solutions that are cheaper. Um, I don't, I, I actually don't think that'll ever change. Um, I think that's okay. Um, but I think that what that means is like these other options um, that, you know, um, yeah, I just think we, they need to be sort of considered, they need to be on the table. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the, 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 you know, the focus and the challenge is a communicating the trade off between, um, with users and developers. And also I think just like, making it easy to, for example, interoperate between these solutions. Um, 
such that, you know, if you have something that's more trusted, um, a user can sort of easily move those assets to a trustless solution. Um, and even if they don't have a trustless guarantee that they'll be able to move them, they can sort of audit what's going on and sound the alarms if they don't. Like, you know, leaning on auditability um, and leaning on interoperability um, is, is going to be more important, I think, um, as we, as w what I predict will happen, happens, <laughs> which is that, you know, again, these, these highways expand, but they just sort of keep getting built. Um, so that's, you know, my views on this maybe have, have, have changed a bit, but um, yeah, I don't, for that reason, again, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong or evil with, with solutions that aren't strictly trust minimized. Um, we just need to sort of be clear and honest about what's, what's going on. All yeah, right. I, I, but, Go ahead. Finish your thought, and then I have a question for now. Oh. No, I was going to say that in my, I think this is the key distinction between kind of execution environments and interoperability protocols. Because per Daniel's point, if you are on maybe a more trusted or sidechain uh, style system with kind of uh, weaker security guarantees, you can kind of you can always keep an eye on that and then exit to a more trustless environment, like exit to Ethereum mainnet or something, right? Provided that there is uh, interoperability be between these two environments. But one of the things that scares me and kind of comes back to the topic of multi-sig bridges is the liquidity network effects, as mentioned earlier, where if you are stuck in a certain token representation um, and that has captured network effects, if that representation is secured by kind of a multi-sig bridge or custodial bridge, you're, you don't, is there a way to exit? Like, is there a way for you to get out of that situation or are you just kind of stuck in a local maxima? Um, yeah. That is the key thing. I think that systemic risk is what's different between the same kind of dilemma from, between an execution environment and bridges. Right. And I mean, and, and I totally do think we should sort of loop this back into bridges now because um, this is a good segue to go into like the multi state bridges themselves a bit. But, you know, it's like it, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to think about bridges, especially bridges between these very, very high value systems that are largely doing DeFi at this stage. Um, it becomes very difficult to think about, OK, well, how do we how do we keep these bridges, uh, how do we make sure that we don't end up in a situation where now we're using multi sig bridge forever? Um, and like, you know, it, it, you can always argue and say, okay, well, it's it's fine to use as a temporary solution right now to solve the problem while we continue growing. But um, as these systems grow, it becomes increasingly difficult to, I mean, it's just sort of like, uh, once once you have a system that gets a lot of power, uh, I, have, I have yet to find very many systems out there that autonomously will give up that power. Um, you know, usually there are then forcing functions that make it so that the system now needs to like hold on to that power or uh, uh, utilize that power in a certain way, and people eventually become re reluctant to let it go because it involves now democratizing something that you're benefiting from. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Arjun, earlier you said something that I thought was really kind of poignant and is kind of like the crux of this discussion we're having here and we're having as part of Burning Bridges. Um, you said, how secure is the system? And how does that model affect the way I build my application? And I kind of pinned tweet here that, you know, uh, just quotes you on that. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen with a multi-sig bridge? And uh, maybe we can kind of build up from there and kind of discuss the solution based on how we solve that. Yeah. You lose $320 million and you don't have a market maker to recover. Yeah, but, but I mean, how, how does that happen? You know, um, obviously we, we heard about the, the wormhole bridge hack. That was a smart contract bug. Uh, let's, let's talk about trust models here. Um, how, how does how does the the economic attack occur yeah. on a uh, multi sig bridge? So we we've been fortunate so far that like we've never we haven't had any economic attacks occur on these bridges yet. We have a, a, a we have had economic attacks occur on chain, chains and L twos, um, or I guess mock L twos, um, where you know uh, like for instance you know etc being fifty one percent attacked this is like a great example of this where like this is a very very good example of why like you can't just have a community. Uh, coast on the fact that they have, uh, like, have a permissionless validator set, and then coast on the fact that they have a permissionless validator set forever without eventually somebody trying to attack it. Like, if there is value there, people will try to extract it at some point. And I think that's one of the issues with with these multi-sig bridges is like the way the core, the way that the core trust model of of these things works, and it and it's always sort of it, it can happen in several different ways, right? So you can have you can have a literal multi-sig on chain, uh, which is the dumb, the very very smooth brain version of doing it. You can have an MPC system, um, which basically is uh, MPC is, is multi-party computation. 
Um, MPC is basically a privacy solution similar to like, uh, you know, zero knowledge stuff that is being co-opted in this case towards like off-chain coordination. And the idea with MPC is like you, you remove the need to have like very expensive coordination on chain by making this process happen off chain. Uh, and then, and then, uh, and then putting some sort of proof on chain that everybody, everybody agreed to something. Um, and, and so it's like a, it's like a more scalable version of doing a multi-sig, uh, that unfortunately still has the same limitations. It's still like, you know, uh, it's still, you still can't really scale past a certain number of signers. You still really can't like from a practical perspective, it's just going to cost to take a lot of time to do anything if you do. Uh, and you still, you still not really like getting any sort of economic or trust benefit. Um, and then I think the most sophisticated version of this is probably like POS bridges, right? So you have some sort of POS system uh, where, you know, you have validators, you might have like a Cosmos chain or something like that. And then you have, uh, you know, this includes everything from like Seller to Axelar to uh, Thorchain to Poly Network. They're, these, all of these things work exactly the same way um, where you uh, uh, have the validators now saying, you know, two thirds of the validators will now say that this data is valid across chains. Um, um, the problem in all of these cases comes down to how much money is at stake? So how much money has been minted across chains and how much does it actually cost to corrupt the validators? So, you know, if, if I am a validator and I'm earning, you know, say for now, all of the validators of these bridges are like the same people, right? They're, they're just like friends of the teams. They're, they're like professional staking providers. None of those people are going to wreck the system. They're just incentivized not to For the same reason why chain link works, by the way. Um, but at some point, if you want these systems to be open and trust minimized and permissionless, that means you, you need to open the door to allow anyone to come and run a validator. And that's when things get kind of dicey, because it's like, if you open the door to allow anyone to be a multi-sig signer, anyone to come and run a validator for a multi-sig bridge, how do you know for sure that two thirds of the people that are going to be validating a given transaction are not just the same person, or they're not just bribing those people? So if, for instance, uh, you know, there's a hundred million dollars of stake in a bridge, um, and uh, that means that, uh, you know, you would need to have $66 million worth of stake in order to corrupt the bridge. Um, that seems like a very large amount of money, but what if the bridge is securing $10 billion, right? From, a, from an economic trade-off perspective, it's a, it's a very simple equation at that point. It's like, I can go borrow $66 million somehow, or just generate $66 million somehow, and against that, I can get $10 billion. Um, and that equation just gets more and more tricky as, as these bridges grow, because, you know, not only is it, is it the case that you, uh, yeah, you have a bigger and bigger honeypot for people to go after, um, and that those people may be hackers, they also may be governments, they also may be like corporations. Um, you know, what happens if Amazon decides, hey, I want to rug this system? Um, but not only do you have that, you also have this like more difficult problem of like, well, how do you even prove that the cheating occurred in the first place? Um, how can you really be sure that it did? Because whoever really owns that bridge can can kind of retcon history and, and say whatever they want about what happened to the bridge. And uh, and unless you have really good protections built in to stop that, you end up in scenarios, sort of doomsday scenarios like the wormhole hack, where an entire ecosystem's token is now depegged. Yeah, what's what's funny to me is the sort of the trickier cases come up in these like the more middle ground bridges that are not fully trustless, but are kind of trust minimized. Like if a bridge is trustless, it's trustless. If a bridge kind of, um, if it's truly a multi-sig bridge, then ultimately what's stopping one of these hacks is, I mean, putting aside the risk of a bug or an exploit, what's stopping this sort of hack is, 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 is reputation. Benevolence. Right? Yeah. Yeah, benevo yeah. Basically altruism slash public eyeballs on you and reputation, which is like, you know, which is a hard thing to put a price on. Um, right. <laughs> um, that sounds very Hallmark Cardi, but it's, you know, it's sort of true, right? Like that is a, you know, if you know who these entities are and they steal millions of dollars, that's, that's going to affect these people's lives. Um, the middle ground that you described, like a proof of stake bridge, which I wouldn't call that a multi-sig bridge personally, but maybe that's just nitpicky semantics. But if it's sort of a permissionless proof of stake bridge where anybody can stake and participate in, in, in signing off on headers, now you have this situation where, you know, you can't necessarily pinpoint who these entities are because it's permissionless, but they can step in uh, uh, so, so they can step in. But you can, as you say, literally put a price tag on, on, um, on you know, the cost benefit ratio of attacking this bridge. I mean, we can probably give at least a lower bound on the minimum amount that you could steal from it. And then you could see how much it costs to become a staker. And then, as you said, if we can raise that money, you have you have you have guaranteed profit if you take the social element out. So. Um, so and what you'll find is a lot of a lot of these bridges will basically try to um, 
you know, cover this case by saying, okay, well, there's a token and that token is, is the like, uh, you know, hold, like told, token holders are sort of like the holders of last resort who, who get diluted in case something happens. Um, and this is, this comes from like the MakerDAO model of, uh, of, of like Oracle governance where, you know, the Oracle, the people who are holding the token are fundamentally the people who are deciding on how Oracles are implemented in MakerDAO. And then of course, as a result of that, like if you are holding Maker, you are the economic backstop for the system. So like Maker's market cap now represents the total amount of backstop that you could have against potentially lost die that results from Oracle manipulation. And it's, coupled, that said, it's a bit, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say coupled with the kind of moon boy sell of like, if the system wins then the token will have to be worth a lot because the value of the token will have to be greater in aggregate greater than what is secured by the system. So it's going to the moon. You can use that as a kind of marketing pitch to draw a lot of kind of uh, liquidity into the system. Right. And see, the thing is in the, in the maker case, like you're constraining the, the fallout from one very specific case around an Oracle that could de like basically could like de peg an asset against the price of something like Ethereum. And over time you can decentralize that Oracle. You can do a lot of like manual human things to kind of make sure that that Oracle is secure. Um, and then of course you could also like use more stable assets as your reserve to, to, to ensure that you never even get to that point in the first place, which is why there's a lot of USDC behind, behind die now. Um, however, um, I think, I think this, like that, the, that thesis or that model doesn't really seem to hold up well for like a cross chain case, because like in the, in the, the potential case, uh, I guess like the, the potential domain of things that you could do to manipulate an Oracle price is generally a lot smaller than the potential loss incurred as a result of all of the LPs on a multi-sig bridge or on a POS bridge just deciding, okay, we just want to collude to steal the funds. Um, and that's when things get a bit tricky because it's like, you know, you have, I think like Thorchain, AnySwap, um, Axelar, and a bunch of others have this model where the idea is that every, every participant in the system stakes tokens um, and if, uh, you know, if cheating occurs, then those tokens are slashed. Um, but the questions that are, are not really answered are, how do you know if cheating has occurred? Uh, because in order to prove that cheating has occurred, you actually need a cross-chain messaging mechanism. Um, so it actually just creates the same dependency that you already have. Um, and then more importantly, you know, if, if that cheating does occur, and you're re repaying people in your token, well, what is what is driving the value of your token? And And then when you dig into like the, the white papers of these these systems, you realize that the thing that's driving the token is the security of the system. So it's actually recursive because people basically the projects are saying um, our token is valuable because you need it to secure uh, secure the liquidity in the system, and the liquidity in the system is secure because our token retains a high price. Um, okay, so common common question, uh, which I think is important to clarify on, if all say take a hundred validator set um, validator bridge. If 67 of those validators all reach consensus, then obvious question, or, or I guess simple question is, doesn't that stop cheating from occurring? Um, I mean, the, the question sort of comes becomes like, who are those 67 validators, right? If this is an open permissionless system, uh, could you civil attack those 67 validators? You, you don't, it, it's, it's impossible to 100% ascertain identity in these systems. So you, you, I guess we, we talked about this a little bit with the layer zero, uh, conversation, but there's there's a trade-off space between like permissionlessness and uh, civil resistance, right? Where like if you make a system truly permissionless, which means you make it so that anyone can create an account and and like interact with it, then what you're saying there is that you don't really care about identity. You're not going to be checking identity. You're not going to be like whitelisting people or restricting access to a certain subset of the population. But if you do that, now you have this potential attack vector, which is um, civil attacks, uh, which are basically um, a bunch of people go and create anonymous accounts and use that to flood uh, basically the, the the whole system and make it so that they can pretend that there are now 66 validators when in reality there's only one validator. Um, the question becomes, how do you ensure that that's not happening? So either you have to make it a permission validator set, which is centralized um, and uh, and has like its own set of risks uh, because now you know who those validators are, you can go and bribe them, um, or you make it a permissionless validator set, in which case now you need to be really, really certain that all 100 of those people are not the same person. Yep, and I guess the meme way of saying that is in a permission system, you have to go find all the people that are kind of known and convince them to collude with you. Whereas in a POS style system, it, that bribery is institutionalized in the protocol. You just right. need to buy the asset and then you can become the 67 validators. Yeah. And I think- Or create, thing... create a bribing 
DeFi protocol on top of it to bribe people to steal. I mean, this is, this is actually kind of interesting. Like we, I have spent some time thinking about the possibility of creating a bribing system on top of things like Thorchain, because you can actually, you, there is an economic attack that you can do where you can create a DAO on top of Thorchain, AnySwap, and all of these other systems, where the DAO's whole goal is to get people to buy into the DAO to execute an e economic attack on these systems by purchasing enough of the stake. Um, and by um, doing that, you could steal all the funds. <laughs> yes, that's possible. Now, before before we get too off the rails here, with our, with our, <laughs> Bur burning our burning bridge let down me, incoming. Before we literally start burning bridges, um, let me let, to play devil's advocate on this this other side of the argument of of these sort of bridges that depend on tokenomics a bit. Um, what I think where this what if, you know if we had someone here to represent the other side, what I think the argument would start to reduce down to is the the basic economic assumption there about the value of a token the sort of social agreement about the value of a token preventing certain types of attacks. Um, you could argue that's sort of analogous to assumptions that we make about layer ones as well. Um, in other words, you know, I mean, as you say, yeah, Arjun, I'm sure whatever you have in mind is probably economically effective as a way to attack for a chain, but there's all sorts of weird, you know, you can, you can create smart contracts on Ethereum, which kind of break the game. 51% attack. Yeah, 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 for sure. Right. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Even if it's a 51% attack, this is maybe a bigger topic for another day, but, there's all sorts of things that, let's just stick with proof of work for a second. There's all sorts of things that a 51% cartel, or I guess a 41% cartel, whatever it takes, um, could do that literally on paper would be profitable, but they don't. Like they continue to not do it, even though they could. And really, if you just sort of get down to it, clearly there is some sort of social agreement going on there. Um, so that, you know, once you sort of accept that, you could sort of say that, okay, we're just sort of doing something similar on the bridging level. Um, I'm not saying I necessarily buy that argument, but I do think where that where that argument gets more kind of complicated and interesting and something that we should at least tease because we didn't we teased it but didn't go into it earlier um, is with something like header relays, um, because with a header relay bridge, at least it sort of depends on the details. There's different types of header relays and different ways of doing it. But one notion of a header relay is you're kind of bridging between two chains and you're effectively, you know, you're getting kind of light client security from one side on the other, which kind of means you're depending on the, um, the set of miners or the set of validators on one chain to not do anything too malicious. Um, so you're kind of doing this economic security bridge, but you're using a pre-existing L1, um, which means I think you can start to make this argument that you're like piggybacking off of whatever social consensus there is on being a Bitcoin miner or being an Ethereum miner. Um, I think that gets, um, yeah, that's another kind of middle ground or maybe like a middle ground of a middle ground of a crypto economic bridge that's kind of like proof of stake, but but instead of just like introducing this new term, you're you're using a pre-existing one and pre-existing mechanism. Um, that, that would certainly um, be much yeah. more palatable, to be honest, because I think like, you know, like you, you asked a little bit about like the token economics of, of the system of like, okay, well, there is, you can find other ways to manipulate the price of like a layer one, for instance, to to try to like, you know, attack the, the staked security of that layer one. But it's become, it's, a, it's actually a lot more difficult because the the value the the kind of like price drivers for an L1 system are not just you know the the tokens that are being bought to stake. Um, there are there are also price drivers that come from um, you know the the fact that there is demand to purchase the token in order to use it for fees. Um, there are okay. also other kinds of like economic mechanisms, checks and balances that ensure that like manipulating the price of this token is going to be more more difficult than you would expect. Um, exactly. Whereas you know yeah. in in a case where like the token's price is complete completely you know, free, uh, except for people buying it to stake, um, it gets a little bit more dicey because it's like, yes. Yeah. No, like I, there, yeah, there no. is a lot of price manipulation in this space already, even for does, does that beg the question that this would be solved if that, if the validator bridge actually becomes useful for other things? That I think that kind of is the crux of it, right? If the validator bridge or if the underlying mechanism is 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 broader than just a bridge yes if it's part of a wider ecosystem one version of that is it you know it effectively is its own l1 um because then at least you can say that you know corrupting it is a bigger deal <laughs> um right. and, and maybe if, if that if that ecosystem that l1 ecosystem is already you know is thriving has its own values has its own social consensus then the idea of corrupting that whole thing just for the sake of this bridge is less likely assuming that there's like less economic activity going on on this particular bridge than the L1 ecosystem at large. Um, right. This is, I'm not sure where I stand on this exactly, to be honest, but it's just sort of one thing that, that 
that I've been thinking about. I actually, kind of, um... I actually agree, by the way. I, I think that I think you're right that like this having having a system that is secured by another asset where that asset is not necessarily tied to the system itself is is an objectively better solution. And if you the, the main question then becomes like how can you be sure that like the the value of the asset that is securing the system uh, and the amount of the asset that's securing the system is greater than or equal to the amount of value at risk in the system. Um, right. And but and that's actually kind of where the problem then starts because it's like you always have these trade-offs that exist um, around this stuff and like the trade-off that you then run into is like okay um, it is a lot easier to bootstrap ten billion dollars worth of economic security using your own token that you printed out of thin air than it is to bootstrap ten billion dollars of economic security uh, by getting people to go and buy ETH. Um, <laughs> the, funny, the funny the funny thing here is if your the validator bridge actually becomes a full throttled layer one itself, then you kind of defeated maybe even defeated the purpose of bridging to the original destination chain to begin with, because the validator bridge can just drink their milkshake and <laughs> them or whatever. <laughs> so anyway, I think we we are two minutes off of the scheduled time to finish. Should we talk about solutions? Did we, did we cover solutions? We would 100 percent not talk about solutions or how <laughs> developers should you know decide between those solutions. Sorry, um, no time for solutions. We should do that. <laughs> yeah, the space, is, the space is only the problems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I, I can stay on for a few more minutes just to ch chat about that and and wrap up. Um, if you yeah. Um, uh, should, should we bring Rahul up here? He's got a request from him. Sure. Hey, Rahul, you can talk now. But uh, launch into You don't have to. See what he has to say. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start on that. Um, does anyone have a, a good place that they want to start in terms of solutions in the solution set? Only use Cosmos and IBC ever. That would be very nice. IBC is a very, very cool system. Hey. Hey, um, can you guys hear me? Oh, hey. Hey, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I know we're like low on time here. I just, I thought it was something interesting to jump in on because uh, Arjun and I have had this conversation before. You got, it like relates to what you guys were talking about, but actually like running code on the ETH2 validate or the ETH2 validator set that actually can validate like other kinds of things besides just ETH2. So then you could essentially use the entire set of ETH2 validators as like a bridging validator. I just wanted to like kind of hear what you guys thought about something like that. Yeah, yeah. by the way, uh, credit to Sri Ram for this idea because he's he's the person who, who originally brought it up and he's, uh, uh, we shouted him out earlier in this chat as well. Sri Ram, are you, do you have time? Are you able to come on up? Don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think it'd be cool to hear from you. Um, yeah, I assume what you're talking about is sort of having like client side parameters, if, if I just sort of fill in the gaps here of, of, of what I think you're suggesting, client side parameters that nodes can use that are kind of opt in, where they do more than just, you know, validate what's necessary for L1 consensus. Um, and that I actually think will increasingly just happen. Um, and I think that makes sense um, as, a, as a direction that like software goes, where just things will sort of merge more, where, um, um, where running an L1 node will also, you know, it'll be easy to run an L1 node and validate X or Y rollup or and validate X or Y bridge. I think that does make sense. Um, you just want to be careful to maintain the separation of what's what's part of L1 consensus and what isn't. But um, right. but yeah, I, 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 I could see that where things, that be where things go. Right. Um, it's a pretty elegant solution because it's like you're, you're basically like, um, uh, you know, amortizing the costs of going and bootstrapping your own validator set. You're just saying like, here's, you know, so, so like, I'm I'm bearish on that whole idea of like okay let's go get a new validator set in general because I think it just takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. Um, having had first hand experience with trying to go and get a bunch of people to like run infrastructure and coordinating all of them, it just it's a it's a really difficult process and like um, having to do that for every new application like it seems like uh, you know one of the key things that that we got that we got out of like the EVM and out of like being able to go and build smart contract applications is that you can just go and build the app and you don't have to worry about like the core details of how it is decentralized. It is just automatically decentralized in trust environment. And I think that's yeah. like uh, having, having the ability to have like validator set as a service or like, you know, sell economic security as a service seems to be a direction that I think people will start going in the next like six to 12 months where you'll have, I am almost certain that you'll have Chainlink try to do this as well. Um, where they will now start selling their their economic security from the core network 
uh, in order to do other kinds of things. I would I would argue that like fair sequencing services, for example, is an is it is a good example of this, where like they're they're selling chain link economic security to do something else that isn't actually Oracle based. You'll have to bend the knee to the dawn. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Arjun, yeah, and I uh, think... hi, Adil Sriram here. Thanks for uh, asking me. And uh, sorry, it took me a minute to get the permissions on. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I completely agree with what Arjun said. The idea that the same economic security of a core network can now be offered to many things. What that does is beyond security, the economics of it, the marginal economics is also quite favorable. For example, if you're staking in a new middleware, uh, or like for example, a bridge, you have to worry about whether you're retrieving your capital cost that, you know, are you getting a 10% APR at least? Whereas if you're restaking your ETH, which already is an yield bearing asset, then the marginal economics is much more favorable. So this can potentially attract a much larger security pool at a given revenue budget. So I think uh, I, I agree with Arjun on the thesis of where uh, this kind of validator reusing and stake reusing can go. Yeah. But this is just really a block size increase. Um, I mean, that's functionally what it is. And so yeah, I, I agree, I think this is definitely going to be a thing, but it's gonna be a thing in a case where you have a whole bunch of money um, that, that's sitting around and not really doing anything at the moment. So I don't think this yeah. is really a good fit for the Ethereum validators, but like Chainlink or you know the Cosmos hub, which is just kind of sitting there, not really doing anything, um, it would make sense to put that money to work securing other networks. And it would well, get them cash flows as well. Right. I guess one way to think about it is like you're basically creating a marketplace for risk for the validator, right? And you're saying like as a validator of a given system, if you have staked a certain amount of economic security, you basically have a certain baseline risk of like the amount of slashing you're willing to expose yourself to as part of that economic security, um, as part of providing that economic security and, and your risk model around it. And like the, the, you know, generally speaking, running an E2 validator at the moment is quite safe. So there, there's certainly a domain of uh, liquidity and infrastructure providers who who are probably like, okay, I'm willing to double down on the pot potential, on the on the possibility of getting slashed, if it means I could try to squeeze out a bit more revenue out of this. And, yeah, and I so think I, that, that's an interesting market. It's an interesting market. I think what, I think it was Brandon, if that's your point. Yeah, what Brandon said is like kind of the key point here though, is if you, you know, we don't want this to effectively turn into a block size increase, but you know, with extra steps, cause that would be bad. If we're doing a block size increase, we should, we should do that and be honest about what it is. Um, so would it turn into, I guess I, I, I'm, maybe I'm not understanding that actually. Can you explain that a bit better? Well, again, what I'm imagining here is that we just make it very easy and feasible um, for nodes to opt into other, you know, securing other things <laughs> um, for L1 nodes rather, um, or L1 validators, right? And basically, obviously, as long as it's, as long as it is strictly opt-in, it's not actually a block size increase. But if socially we reach this point where we say, hey, as an ETH2 validator, you, you know, you're also, you also should be responsible for validating this rollup because all you have to do is set a client side flag. And if you don't, it, and, and, and if you don't, and something happens on that rollup, then, then whatever, we'll be mad at you. Um, if, if it gets to that point when we sort of expect validators to be doing all this extra work, then we've just effectively added, you know, we've effectively offloaded more work and more resources onto them, which is, which uh, is interesting. functionally okay. equivalent to a block size increase. So I just think it's more of a social question of making that separation very clear of, of, right. of what is and isn't necessary uh, to be a validator. Yeah. Okay. Why, that makes why, sense. Does, why does optionality lead to less risk here? I, I don't quite follow that because if there is significant revenue to be made by extending computation to other services beyond just securing Ethereum, wouldn't we expect all rational validators to pile in and have it effectively become a block size increase? Well, I guess it depends, right? It depends on like the, it basically depends on an individual validator's appetite, basically appetite for risk rel relative to access to infrastructure. And, it, and it's interesting because it's like, it's the same sort of question that would lead to people being like, do I want to run a light client? Do I want to want to run a full node? Do I want to run a fully validating node? Um, or, and, or do I want to run a node that is validating and like on behalf of other people and allowing people to delegate to it? And like uh, what you're basically doing is taking that scale and making it more grant, uh, more kind of like a, a granular rather than just saying, you know, uh, here are three to four options. You're saying here is a spectrum that involves everything from running this, this node and only validating the chain and not earning anything from it to all the way to running a extremely, extremely beefy servers to get as much as you can out of it. 
Um, but it is a good question of like, you know, do we think that that would actually result in centralization risk? Like it, it could, because, you know, one of the core kind of tenets of, of chains is like, you don't really have an unfair advantage in terms of your, your, uh, at least the, the goal is to not have it with, with, you know, GPU, uh, like async resistance and GPU mining is to, to head towards a model where you don't have like too much of an, of an asynchronous, uh, uh, like a asymmetrical advantage as a result of being able to have very, very good infrastructure and run a massive server farm. Um, yeah. So I guess, and, and I'm sorry if I'm derailing the convo, but I'm just like doubling down on the question, which is why not do something like Polkadot then instead of having this like lazy fair sharding of computation um, and have like rotate the validators in a predictable way and have this basically pair of threads, right? I'm misunderstanding something. Um, this yeah, is just burned mining really by different names. So I think that yeah. you know, yeah. probably take a look at the history of merge mining in, in Bitcoin and other places and there'll be a lot of good analogies there. Yeah, Got it. exactly, exactly. And I guess, yeah, my, my only point here is that even just the social distinction between what is expected from validators or even full of node runners to do um, what is required of them and what they sort of can effectively opt into and maybe should opt into, maybe it's in their best interest too. That is a very important distinction to preserve. And I think if if literally the software starts merging, if we have like forks of L1 nodes where we, where we add in these other features, it could get a little messy and um, we should just be on alert. <laughs> For what it's worth, I, I would, if you know, if we are trying to leverage and upsell economic security from a system to be able to do things like bridging or you know fair sequencing or uh, data availability or any of these any of these other like kind of open questions where you do need like a economically secure validator set right now, um, if we were doing that, I, I would I would definitely feel most comfortable if that validator set was the validator set of Ethereum or I guess maybe has a high significant like a significant overlap to the validator set of Ethereum at least. Yep, I hear. Uh, uh, just one brief comment on the comparison to merge mining. If you're merge mining with Bitcoin, something else, you can, there is no fit coupling. So what I mean by that is if you did Bitcoin and some other uh, thing in parallel, you know, if you did something wrong on the other system, it does not bear any, con any consequence onto Bitcoin. Whereas with restaking, if you did something bad to your uh, new service, you could lose your ETH. So there is a much tighter coupling of fate in this uh, e restaking as opposed to merge mining, which is what I think led to the problems of merge mining, which is the fact that each of these chains are fundamentally independent. Yeah, but that's the only way to do it to avoid creating, you know, dependencies at really the consensus level for the parent chain. Because um, if, you know, the, if the parent chain knows something about what's going on in the child chain, that's even if it's being opted into, then that's just a whole nother set of state that it needs to track. And that's essentially a block size increase. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap it up here, everybody. It's uh, 10 after. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Siram. Thank you, Rahul, for kind of hopping up here and